Bronn in the show and Bronn in the books are similar beasts with different journeys. Both are cutthroat sellswords. Both are cunning opportunists. But while Bronn from Game of Thrones rapidly rises through the ranks to become Master of Coin, uh, somehow, Bronn from A Song of Ice and Fire may just decide who sits the Iron Throne. This is the story of the real Bronn. Let me know in the comments if you prefer the show version or the book version, and why. In the first four seasons of the show, these characters share similar paths. Bronn, a sellsword, helps to escort Catelyn Stark to the Vale, before championing Tyrion in a trial by combat against Savardis Egan, which he wins due to his speed and agility. He then enters Tyrion's employ, escorting him to safety and taking part in the Battle of the Green Fork. We learn details about Shobron that aren't in the book. He killed a woman aged 12 in self-defence, he has a younger brother, and he's even ventured beyond the wall. The character even has a northern accent, so perhaps he's from the north. Bronn continues to protect Tyrion in King's Landing, acting as his friend and bodyguard. He's named Captain of the City Watch after Jano Slint is sent to the Wall. He personally guards the acting Hand of the King and later partakes in the Battle of Blackwater Bay, launching the flaming arrow that activates Tyrion's wildfire trap. He's booted from the City Watch by Tywin, but also knighted. The other Lannister siblings have plans for him. He helps to train the one-handed Sir Jaime Lannister, while Cersei Lannister marries him to Lollis Stokeworth, the daughter of Lord Stokeworth, essentially a bribe to prevent him from championing Tyrion during his trial by combat. Book Bronn is similar, but there's more to his tale. Bronn is described as thin and sharp as a bone, a ruthless man with a wolfish smile. He rides with a fellow sellsword named Chigan, and the both of them seize the opportunity to escort Catelyn Stark to the Eyrie. On the way, he fights against mountain clansmen, puts the wounded Chigan out of his misery, and develops a rapport with the captured dwarf. When Tyrion demands a trial by combat, the sellsword tries his luck. The light and lithe mercenary defeats the heavily armoured Savardis Egan by crushing him with a statue. With the promise of Lannister gold, he escorts Tyrion from the Vale, finds him a camp follower named Shay, and fights at the Battle of the Green Fork. He then accompanies Tyrion, the newly made acting Hand of the King, to King's Landing. After all, a Lannister always pays his debts. Bronn continues to be Tyrion's man and is named Captain of the Red Cloaks, Tyrion's personal Lannister guard. He becomes a diligent ally. He hires almost 800 sellswords to protect his new patron, helps Tyrion find conspirators to free Jaime Lannister from custody, and protects water wagons dealing with the fires following the King's Landing riot. He even hires three double agents to spy on Cersei, the Kettleblack brothers, sellswords all, who Cersei believes work for her. Sir Osmond is named to the Kingsguard, while Sir Osfrid later becomes commander of the City Watch, and Sir Osney becomes Cersei's sworn sword. Unbeknownst to Bronn and Tyrion, however, they are actually triple agents, working for Littlefinger himself, as he reveals to Sansa Stark in the Vale. When Bronn isn't scheming with Tyrion, of course, he's busy cavorting with cheap prostitutes. During the Battle of the Blackwater, Bronn oversees the oxen pulling Tyrion's giant chain across the Blackwater, blocking Stannis' fleet from escaping the wildfire. For his valiant efforts, he is knighted Sir Bronn of the Blackwater, on the recommendation of Lord Tywin Lannister. He takes a personal sigil, a green flaming chain on a smoking grey field. Tywin dismisses Bronn's sellswords, bringing his own loyal red cloaks. But Bronn has risen higher. Now a knight, he begins wearing a woolen doublet, he frequents high class brothels on the Street of Silk, and he's even invited to attend the wedding between Tyrion and Sansa Stark. But at the end of the day, he is still a ruthless sellsword. When the singer Simon Silvertongue tries to blackmail Tyrion with knowledge of his illicit relationship with Shay, the imp orders Bronn to discreetly dispose of him. The bard ends his days in a tasty bowl of brown. After Tyrion is imprisoned, Bronn does not train Jaime Lannister. That role is taken by Sir Ilan Payne, the mute slayer of Ned Stark, and one of the silent butchers of Westeros. Cersei does marry him off to Lola Stokeworth as a bribe, and Bronn refuses to fight for Tyrion. So how exactly is a low-born cutthroat turned unlanded knight able to marry a noble lady? For one, the old lady Tander Stokeworth is desperate for someone to marry her second daughter, as her firstborn Felice doesn't appear to be having any children with her husband. For two, Lollis is not socially well regarded by the Westerosi nobility. She is simple of mind and soft of body, a victim of thugs who left her pregnant with a bastard during the riot of King's Landing. For three, Cersei organised the marriage, and Cersei is a bit of an idiot. Back to the show. 
Seasons 5 to 8 are where the characters wildly diverge. And I mean, wildly. Unfortunately for Bronn, the promised marriage to Lollis has been scuppered, and she is instead betrothed to Sir Willis Bracken. Not a character in the books, but hey, neither is King Oris I, or Megor III. You know what, it's fine, using existing book characters would be far too easy. Anyway, the duo are captured. Bronn is poisoned and later saved by Tyene Sand, and he's told that he does not need a good girl, but a substandard cat. Bronn is later hired by Jaime, with more promises of gold and castles, to attend the Siege of Riverrun, which is a success, and he later celebrates at the Twins. Still desperate for that castle, Bronn joins the Sack of Highgarden, and is later ambushed during the Battle of the Gold Road by Daenerys and her Dothraki army. He fights back, and even temporarily cripples Drogon by shooting its wing with a scorpion bolt. He rescues Jaime from Dragonfire, and rescues him again from drowning in his plate armour, somehow. Here we reach the climax of Showbron's arc. Kyburn and Cersei hire him, promising him that fool's dream of a castle and highborn wife. In return, he must assassinate Tyrion Lannister, his former patron and friend. However, he instead promises to spare Tyrion in exchange for what he's always wanted, and more. Tyrion promised to pay the sellsword double whatever Cersei offered, and what's double a castle? Well, the twin towers of Frey lay to the north, currently unoccupied after Arya's poison massacre. Bronn is granted the twins, where he- Hi, Garden. Wait a minute. Wait, huh? Wait, wait. Wait, 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 wait! So yeah, Bronn is granted High Garden and the Lord Paramountcy of the Reach, despite having no legitimate blood claim to that title. Using his economic prowess, such as his self-professed lack of knowledge about the nature of debt, he becomes King Bran's Master of Coin, and presumably runs the kingdom into financial ruin. In the books, Bronn goes on to marry the pregnant Lollis Stokeworth. Before falling off a horse and shattering her hip, her mother Tanda Stokeworth wishes for the bastard to be named Tywin, but Cersei furiously rejects the offer. So Bronn instead names him Tyrion Tanner, which further infuriates her. She grows paranoid that the cutthroat may still be in league with Tyrion, so plots with Felice Stokeworth and her husband, Sir Bauman Birch, to kill him. Instead of a hunting mishap or a similar tragic accident, Bronn is instead challenged to a duel by Sir Bauman. Bronn crushes the knight underneath his own horse, forces him to confess Cersei's involvement, and then slays him without mercy. He then gathers up his loyal men and kicks Felice out of Castle Stokeworth. Cersei gives the woman to Kyburn to hide her own involvement in a murder plot. She dies in the black cells, screaming. The bedridden Lady Tanda, meanwhile, dies of a chill or perhaps more sinister means. Lollis becomes Lady Lollis, and Bronn declares himself Lord of Stokeworth. The winds of winter are approaching, and Bronn's story is not over. Stokeworth is a strategically important piece of land, supplying King's Landing with food. The same is true of Rosby. Lord Giles Rosby died of his illness, leaving no heir. His second wife was a cousin of Lollis Stokeworth, meaning that she, and therefore Bronn, may have a claim to Rosby. If Bronn snatches it, it would grant him control of the Crown Land's breadbasket. Bronn may block food from entering King's Landing during Aegon Targaryen's invasion, aiding the young monarch. Whether he's truly a Targaryen or a Blackfire, a victorious Aegon would likely reward Bronn for his help, perhaps with more land, or an even higher station. If a dance of dragons is waged between Daenerys and Aegon, Bronn may find himself facing off against his former friend Tyrion, or perhaps the opportunist will pick the side that has dragons. Of course, he may not continue his meteoric rise. Pride comes before the fall, and Bronn's fall would certainly be steep. But for now, the cunning cutthroat remains underestimated, and a wolf in sheep's clothing is a dangerous thing indeed. Fantasy Haven finally has some merch. If you want some hoodies, t-shirts, beanies, or mugs, check out fantasyhavenmerch.com to support the channel. And if you want to explore the history of House Royce, check out this video. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like, subscribe, and check out the Patreon. Special thanks to my Lord of Light patrons, Andre, Boombler, Caden, Coleshot, and Devcole. 